Code Part 2, Fathomable, Feasible, and Fundable Strategies for Early Career Grant Writing with Dr. Laura Berner. Um, I'm Annie Hanos. I am one of the co-chairs of the Early Career Special Interest Group at AAD um, that's sponsoring this webinar. And I'm also gonna be your moderator today. Also with us is Ronald Fan, who is AED's membership manager. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns about this webinar, you can feel free to um, reach out to Don Gannon at AED headquarters via email at dgannon, G-A-N-N-O-N, at aedweb.org. Um, and we just have a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, first of all, all participants are muted except for the speakers and myself. Um, and that will be, continue to be the case throughout the webinar. Um, the webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes and is being recorded. And um, after uh, it's complete, it will be posted on the AED website shortly. Um, and uh, members can download it at their convenience uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, when Dr. Berner begins her presentation in a few minutes, um, she, she'll present and then answer questions from the audience after. Um, the way you submit your questions uh, throughout is um, using the Q&A box at the bottom middle of your screen. So you can go ahead and type in your questions there and um, I'll see them and I will uh, read them um, out loud to the rest of um, the the attendance when the question portion of the webinar begins. Um, so Laura, um, can we check your volume real quickly? Um, can you say a few words and and then uh, can some of the participants please write in the Q&A box to let us know if they can hear you? Sure, can everybody hear me okay? Anybody feel like uh, writing in the Q&A box that they can hear Laura? If you can, oh, yes, thank you, thank you, Great. thank you. Um, okay, so thanks for letting us know that the volume level's good. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Laura Berner is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Eating and Weight Disorder Center of Excellence in the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She earned her PhD from Drexel University and then completed her postdoctoral fellowship at the University of California, San Diego Eating Disorder Center for Treatment and Research. Um, we're really excited to have um, Dr. Berner as our expert today um, because she has a really significant history of successful early career grantsmanship. So to date, her research has been funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, the Hilda and Preston Davis Foundation, the American Psychological Association, and the Academy for Eating Disorders. And um, especially relevant to today's discussion, um, Laura has received more training grants than anybody I know. <laughs> um, actually, <laughs> she's received an F31, an F32, and a K23 from the NIMH. Um, so she's particularly well suited to give us some concrete tips on how to um, uh, successfully write grants. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Berner, for speaking with the Early Career Membership today on strategies for successful grant writing as an early career investigator. Sure, well, thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction. I'm excited to be able to speak to all of you today um, and share some of my tips and tricks for writing these kinds of training grants, which um, are a unique sort of beast when it comes to grant writing. Um, so I wanna actually start with some disclaimers. Um, the first of which is that this presentation is really based solely on my personal experience. So take everything with a grain of salt and some skepticism. Um, it's also only my responsibility, doesn't necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health or Mental Health. Um, and this presentation today is really gonna focus on early career and specifically training grant writing strategies, as Annie mentioned. Um, so if you haven't already, please go back and also watch the first video for this Cracking the Code series to learn more about logistics and um, very important overall training grant considerations from Kendra Becker and Jason Lavender. 
Okay, so um, now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Um, one of the most frequent questions that I get from folks who are thinking about writing a training grant is, when do I start this whole process? Um, and I usually say you need to ask yourself a, qu a question first to figure that out, which is, am I the kind of person who has really fast processing speed, tends to produce really creative ideas under time pressure? Um, I tend to get well-formed thoughts to come out pretty well the first time my, my finger hits the keyboard. Um, and if that describes you, and believe it or not, I know some people that that describes well, um, then you probably wanna leave at least about three months um, for writing uh, in advance of your department's deadline. So every department usually has a deadline by which they want all the materials to go into the department. Um, and I think on average, that's usually around two weeks, sometimes more ahead of when the official NIH deadline is. Um, if you're more like me, um, who's somebody who can get very lost in details and lit review rabbit holes, um, does better having plenty of time to review updated literature and come up with and scrap lots of ideas and tends to sort of follow the adage that 90% of writing is revising, um, then you want to leave yourself more time. I would say at least about six months in advance of the departmental deadline is when it's a good idea to start thinking about putting pen to paper and, and really starting um, getting some of your ideas down. Um, so that's sort of how I generally think about um, timeline. And then the other big question that people often ask is where do I start? Um, and different people have different ideas about um, this. I know some people like to sort of get the ball rolling and kind of start with uh, sections that describe like facilities and resources and your training environment, things that are kind of boilerplate for your institution because it makes people feel like they're kind of getting going on something and at least they're getting going with writing. Um, particularly with training grants, I tend to take the approach of eating the frog, um, which is sort of an old um, expression from I think it was Mark Twain. Um, and the basic idea is to start with the most um, distasteful thing first, um, knowing that there are going to be hard things and things that you don't want to do, going ahead and getting those out of the way first. And so when it comes to writing training grants, um, that really includes the meatiest sections that you're probably going to revise and re-revise the most over the course of your grant writing um, journey. So that includes the specific games, um, that project summary or abstract section of the grant, and the research strategy. And then if you're writing a K award, this also includes the budget. Um, that's not only because usually departments like to have the budgets pretty early on in your process, um, but it's also because you have a very limited research budget in a K award, um, and you don't wanna to get too tied to a research idea that's gonna be really expensive and won't be um, feasible within the budget of a K. You don't have to do a budget for um, F series grants, so it's only applicable for K awards. And then the other um, sort of pieces to start thinking about early are um, any documents that you have to request from other people, even if you're just sort of putting out general feelers to let people know that you'll be requesting the specific document at a later time from them. Um, so this includes um, both biosketches and consultant letters um, and mentor letters from your mentors and consultant team, um, recommendation letters from your referees. Um, you need at least three referees for I think all training grants through NIH. Um, and if you are working with recruitment sites, if you're recruiting a difficult to recruit population or your institution doesn't have an easy means of recruitment of the population that you're studying, it can be helpful to have letters of support from places where you'll be recruiting. Um, and those are helpful to ask for early. So why is it that I recommend that you start with, um, in particular, specific aims, the project abstract, and the research strategy? Um, part of it is because you want to sort of get a sense of the map of your project early on. Another part of it is because these are the sections that are going to um, die and come back to life many times throughout the process of um, writing your grant. And these are also the sections that I would recommend, especially as a trainee and someone learning to write grants, that you want to get the most feedback on from as many people as possible. So what do I mean by that? Well, just to give you a sense, um, here are all the people who either reviewed these sections of, of my grant, of my case specifically, or at least met with me over the phone or at a conference to talk through 
some parts of these sections. Um, in addition to my local mentors who were on the grant, there were two local mentors who were not involved um, specifically with my K mentorship or consultant team who reviewed some of these sections or talked them through with me. Four remote mentors who weren't at all specifically involved um, in the grant. Three grant writing groups that were um, local and institutional. One was through the psychiatry department and the other two were um, more broad writing groups, um, which was actually really helpful to get feedback from people who have no idea what eating disorders are. I would highly recommend doing that. Um, three local peers in my lab um, who gave me really detailed feedback and were really invaluable in getting, um, in particular, my K funded. Um, my program officer, so Mark Chavez is a really important person to talk to early um, and often with throughout this process. I think um, Kendra and Jason did a really nice job of driving that point home in their webinar. Um, and he was willing to meet with me at a conference. We sat and sort of talked through the general ideas. Um, and then he um, sort of gave me some overarching feedback on specific aims. And also, um, I'd recommend showing pieces of your grant to people in your family and in your personal life um, who might not fully understand the intricate details of what you're studying, but are really helpful checks on making sure that you're describing things in a way that are super easy to understand. Um, and I'm going to touch uh, next on why that in particular is really important to think about. So um, those are sort of the when and what to get started with. But um, then I think for somebody who's starting to learn how to write grants, the next biggest question is, how do I think about sort of approaching this beast of a process? Um, and so I want to start by introducing you to what I think is a really important theme to keep in mind across all of these meaty sections of the grant, um, which is the notion of sticky ideas. And this is a notion that was introduced to me by um, Martin Paulus, who's one of my mentors and is um, really in particular a fantastic mentor in grant writing. Um, and he introduced me to this idea from this book, um, which is also excellent, called Made to Stick. Um, the info's there at the bottom of the slide if you wanna look it up or grab it on Amazon or at your library. Um, and I think these are really helpful ideas um, to use when you're editing your grant and when you're sort of crafting different sections. So I wanna um, review the sort of key tenets of what a sticky idea is with all of you. Um, so the first piece of this is that you want to present your reviewers with a simple but profound, crisp, plain talk, dumbed down and compact idea. So even if we're talking about a process that's incredibly complex, which in science usually the processes are, you want to make it sound incredibly simple to the reviewer. Um, you also want your idea to be somewhat unexpected, right? We know from neurocognitive research that people tend to remember things when their expectations are violated. So we want to, as much as possible, try to violate the expectations of our reviewers so that they're interested in our grant and we've grabbed their attention in some way. We also want our ideas to be concrete. Um, Oh, sorry, I'm just getting a message to move my cursor off the slideshow screen. Hopefully that's better. Um, we also want to keep our ideas concrete. So um, you want to assume that no one reading your grant knows anything about eating disorders because they probably won't, especially for a training grant mechanism. It's possible that none of the folks who are pulled into your special review group have expertise in eating disorders. Or maybe if you're lucky, somebody called in to discuss your grant who has expertise in eating disorders. Um, and for that reason, you really wanna keep your ideas simple and concrete and as much as possible. Um, it's not a bad idea to draw parallels to ideas that are more familiar to people. Um, so that is to say, you could think about, are there ways that the disorder that I'm studying is really similar to this other disorder that I think most of the reviewers reviewing my grant will be very familiar with and see if you can draw that explicit parallel so that you're sort of talking in a language that your reviewers will, all, will already understand. Um, you also want your ideas to be credible. Um, and by that, I mean you wanna present them with facts that are easily digestible and that help your reviewer test your idea using statistics that have visceral impact. 
And I'm going to talk um, in a couple slides about what I mean by visceral impact. Um, but you want to think about what we know from lots of um, economic and social psychology research that's told us about how important framing is. So you want to think about um, as somebody who's sort of in marketing for their grant, how can I frame the statistics in a way that gets people to be very surprised by and struck by um, the power of the statistics that you're presenting. So I'll go over um, an example of that with all of you. Um, the last, the second to last um, tenet in this is something that I think we don't think about very often, particularly uh, as grant writers, which is that you want to evoke an emotion in your reviewer. Um, and that's because we know people tend to remember um, and get invested in ideas that make them feel something. Um, and so in the case of writing a training grant, you're not only trying to get your reviewer to feel some positive emotion about your grant and your idea research-wise, but you're also wanting to get them um, to feel positive emotion about you, to feel excited about you, to feel um, enthusiastic about NIH investing money in you. And um, that's sort of the emotion that you want to come through through when it's their time to speak um, in the review panel room and to introduce your grant to the rest of the reviewers. Um, so you want it to be really easy for your reviewer to imagine a big benefit to your study and to you getting the training that you're proposing um, and make it very easy for them to answer the question of why should I care about this grant and about this person. The last sort of tenet of sticky ideas is to keep things as story-based as possible. So you want to really hold the reviewer's hand and guide them along a journey with you of how it is that um, we've sort of come to this place in the field, that you came to this idea that you've had, and why is it super important that you investigate this next step. Um, Getting people invested in a story tends to make people act, and in this case, we want them to act to give us better scores on our grant. Um, so you may have noticed that this little acronym spells out success, um, minus the last S, um, to help you remember it. But these are sort of the general um, pieces that are helpful to keep in mind when you're writing all those big sections, the specific aims, the project summary, and the research strategy in particular um, of your grant. So I want to get, go through and give you some specific examples of what this looks like. Um, so the unexpected piece where you're sort of, again, violating maybe what people have anticipated. So here's an example of what that might look like in our field. Um, opening at the beginning of your grant by noting that individuals with binge eating disorder don't actually lose weight after treatment helps them stop binge eating. That might be surprising to some reviewers, particularly reviewers who aren't um, familiar with the treatment of folks with binge eating disorder, um, and might sort of make people say, huh, I'm intrigued by that. I would have thought that people would lose weight when they stop binge eating. I want to read more and understand why that might be the case and how this person's going to study that more, right? So you're getting the person invested in and interested in what you're going to say next. An example of the credible piece, um, and in particular presenting people with stats that have visceral impact, might be um, to start somewhere in the beginning of your specific aims or at the beginning of your research strategy by letting people know that there are so far no empirically supported um, treatments for adult anorexia nervosa and more people die from the disorder than any other psychiatric condition. So there are lots of ways that you could say all of that information. You might say, for example, it has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder. Um, but I, it's worth playing around with seeing which way of stating that fact has the most visceral impact, what seems sort of most striking. And that's the kind of thing that because it's going to be in the first few sentences of your grant application that a reviewer sits down to read um, is worth testing out on people like family and friends too to see what sounds more impressive, what sounds more powerful what's more surprising to you. That's what I mean by visceral impact. And there are stats like this that you can pull um, sort of across the disorders that we all um, study and want to learn more about. What's an example of evoking some emotion um, or connection in a reviewer? Um, well, in our case, because we're thinking about writing training grant applications, um, 
an easy way to do this is to think about how can I introduce myself to the reviewer? I'm obviously not like sending in a picture with my grant and they're not watching a video of me talking about my research. So I have to do my best of introducing myself to them through the words that I'm writing on the page and staying pretty formal in my language. So how can I um, kind of wave at the reviewer to say like, hi, this is who I am, this is what I do. Um, so I got really helpful advice from one of my remote mentors um, through a mentorship program named Erica Forbes. Um, and she recommended really starting out your candidate background section of your K award, um, where you're sort of talking about your background and what your goals are and what your training aims are. She said, I would just start by saying, here's who I am here's the training that I've got, here's my general background, here's where I'm aiming to go, and here's what I need to get there and how this K is gonna help me get there. Um, so I really took that advice to heart and started out my candidate background section by saying, I am a clinical psychologist with training in the psychobiological study of eating disorders. Here's what I aim to do with my research. Ultimately, I've started to move in that direction um, by doing the things that you'll read about below. And this proposed K-23 really represents an important next step toward that goal. So in the first paragraph, that's sort of the version of a wave at the reviewer to say, now you have a sense of sort of who I am. And I'll tell you more about that in detail in a second, but this is the overall thousand foot view of who I am. So why is it easier to write grants with slippery ideas? A lot of reasons, I think. Um, the biggest of which is probably the curse of knowledge. We spend an inordinate amount of time reading papers and writing um, and talking to people who share our knowledge base and our ideas. Um, about what we want to study next. And it's really hard to think about what other people who know nothing about eating disorders might be thinking when they're reading our grant application. We know what we know really well because we know what information we have, but we don't know how confusing it is to other people to understand what we're talking about if they don't know about eating disorders or they don't have our knowledge base. Um, it can also be challenging because sometimes we do have to write grants more last minute and sometimes we do lit reviews last minute and then we're eager to share all the facts and stats that we found um, in our grant applications. We might have jotted down notes about them and then it's hard to sort of tease through them and pick out the ones that are most important and are going to have the most visceral impact. Um, it certainly takes extra cognitive effort to be able to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's um, unfamiliar with the literature you're talking about and who's a tired reader because you're totally emotionally invested in your grant and so it can be hard to imagine how anyone else could not be and just to put it quite simply concrete writing can take more editing than flowery writing that has lots of embedded clauses sometimes i think writing a very simple telegraphic sentence um, that conveys a very complex idea is a lot more challenging. And for me, it takes a lot more editing. So it makes sense that this is all something that we need to be really deliberate in thinking about when we're writing grant applications. So now I've sort of provided you with um, some overall rules to follow as you're writing all of these sections. Um, and I wanna give you another rule in terms of structure for these sections, which is to follow an inverted pyramid structure. So what I mean by that is that you, as much as possible, want to start always with the most important piece of the story and then present your reviewers with the supporting details. And you want to make use of bolded text and underlines and headings to really emphasize what that most important piece of the story is so that the reviewer, when they're going back through your grant and they're writing the summary of the grant or they're going back through your grant and they're verbally presenting your grant to the rest of a room, it's really easy for them to find those most important pieces of the story. And I think the biggest rationale for this is that all of your reviewers are going to be exhausted people who have spent the entire day that they read your grant in meetings and doing their own grant writing and paper writing and maybe even reviewing journal articles before they got to your grant. Um, and so it's likely that they're reading it late at night and they're tired and um, I think when you're at that state, there's probably not much more that is more frustrating than having to go back through somebody's specific aims and read them again, or go back through a big convoluted section of a research strategy and read it again. So you want to keep things as simple as possible for your tired reviewer. 
So I want to talk about um, what applying this kind of strategy would look like in your specific games, because I think it's arguably the most important piece of your grant, and it's you only get one page to do it, so it's important to think about using your space well. So you can think about starting your specific games um, if you're using the inverted pyramid structure with the why should we care piece. So you want to have a spicy opener about a specific and important problem. Right, so here you're using the U and the E of the sticky ideas um, tenants. You wanna present the reviewer then with some facts about what we know so far. Those facts should be very simple, concrete, and credible, hopefully with visceral impact. You wanna highlight very explicitly what the gap in our knowledge is, and this highlighting of the gap should be um, emotion evoking, hopefully story based. If it's unexpected, that's even better. And then you want to get to what is the solution to this problem, at least per my hypothesis, and why is that important? So what's the overall goal of my grant because of that? So you want to use really simple sentence structure to lay that all out for the reviewer. My long term goal is to, again, this is part of um, what you include because it's a training grant. The overall objective of this application is to, my central hypothesis is that, evidence in support of this hypothesis so far, um, again, you're keeping this concrete and credible, and then you're highlighting why is it that this project could change how we think about or treat eating disorders. So you really want to make the case that um, it's very important that this project get funded because of the implications it could have for our field and for your career. And so again, in sort of driving that point home, you want to hit on the unexpected emotion and story-based pieces of the sticky ideas. Then obviously what you're probably really used to seeing in a specific games page is the aims um, sort of set apart in bolded text um, with hypotheses below them. What I want to emphasize is that you want your aims to be independent. So what I mean by that is that the outcome of one aim shouldn't influence the viability of your second aim. So you want to be able to say if aim one is a total bust, aim two still has total independent value on its own. And if aim two is a total bust, then aim one is still really valuable. You don't want either one to hinge on the other. It's also helpful in a training grant if you can, on your specific aims page, list the training goals that you have that line up with what the research aim is. And I'll come back to why that can be helpful um, in a couple of slides. And then you wanna close with what I call the payoff paragraph. Um, so this is a mini paragraph that should be, again, unexpected, emotion evoking, and story based, and really drive home um, your sort of in conclusion, in closing, why is this whole thing really important? What's the big outcome if you get to the finish line? How will this advance the field? How will this advance your career and help you progress toward becoming an independent scientist? So I wanna give you some examples of some structure that you might um, think about following um, in filling in that kind of outline that I went through there. So um, what I like to do in the last narrative paragraph before you see this, the actual aims listed out is give a whole summary of the whole shebang, the whole grant, what you're gonna do, and um, what your training goals are and how it fits in. That sounds like it would take up a lot of space. It doesn't have to. So you can say the overarching hypothesis of this F or K application is that in such and such disorder, blah, 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 whatever your overarching hypothesis is in pretty layman's terms. Again, we're keeping it concrete. We're keeping it simple for our reviewers. To test this hypothesis, I will. So for example, to test this hypothesis, I will compare neural activation of 30 women with bulimia nervosa to 30 group matched healthy controls, completing such and such task during functional magnetic resonance imaging, for example. So, so far that's two sentences, right? Then third sentence, this project will serve as a vehicle for formal training and mentorship in, and then you'll list sort of the overall um, big summary terms for what your training goals are and in a list. And so that's just three sentences that a reviewer, when they're tired or when they're talking about your grant, can come back to your specific aims page to that paragraph and say, here's the big summary of their grant. And I think it's helpful to think about that 
over and over as you're writing different sections of your grant, the reviewer's job is to summarize your grant concisely. Your grant will end up being probably close to 100 pages all told when it's in PDF form. And your reviewer has to synthesize all of that information and come up with a little paragraph that will go into your summary statement or what used to be called pink sheets. And you want to be thinking about how can I make their job simpler? And the answer is provide them with lots of little abstracts all over the place in your grant application. It takes up space, but it's completely worth it. So this is a good place in your specific aims to include a little abstract like that for them. I would also recommend, um, again, to keep things simple and concrete, if your aims are a little tricky and a little involved, to flag what each aim is about. So for example, here in my F32 application, um, I've highlighted in purple text some parentheticals that I actually included in my specific aims to flag to the reviewer, look, aim one is about fMRI, aim two is about behavioral data, so are, am I gonna see behavioral task performance differences between groups? And aim three is about what does this have to do with eating disorder? symptoms. So it can be helpful, again, to use layman terms, layman's terms where possible to sort of highlight to your reviewers, here's what each one of these things is about. Again, that's going to be the language that they can use when they're in the meeting with all the other reviewers talking about your grant. And in the payoff paragraph, you can think about following the structure of results could inform novel treatments by XYZ. The research project and training are essential to launch my career as a, and then you're sort of putting into words what your overall career goal is, what kind of researcher do you want to become, whether that's um, an expert in um, novel ecological momentary interventions for binge eating behavior or whatever it, it is in particular, but then you're also sort of reiterating in your specific games page who it is that you want to be. And this study will inform a next step, whether that's a K23 or an R01, um, or maybe an F32 if you're writing an F31. Um, and you're gonna say, it will inform a next step application examining, blah. So in that blah space here, you wanna let the reviewer know that you've thought about what this is setting you up for. You, you're not like committing to the full new specific games of your R01 that you're gonna put together, but you're showing them that look, I know that this is helping me collect pilot data for a bigger next step, and I've already thought about where I'm going next, so it's worth it for you guys to invest money in me. Um, and so that can be helpful to show in your specific games as well. I wanna to touch briefly on um, the project summary or abstract um, section. I think this is a section that most people wait to write until the end of the grant. Um, I understand why. I would recommend fighting the urge to do that if possible and just radically accepting that you're probably gonna to have to write and rewrite the section a lot of times. The reason is that most reviewers that I've asked who have sat on study section have said that they read this section first and they keep coming back to it as they're reviewing the grant. And they come back to it again and again as they're writing their little synopsis of your grant. Um, and if it's good, then they'll use it as an outline for their presentation of your grant. So you kind of get to decide if their summary is good because you're giving them this summary. Um, so it's a section that I would recommend getting a lot of feedback on. This is a section for my grant that I got feedback on from family and friends and from um, one of those writing groups that had nobody who knew anything about eating disorders in it. Um, and it was incredibly helpful to me. So I would definitely recommend spending some time on this section. Um, it's also a section that you can see from every grant that's been funded by NIH online. So if you've never been on NIH Reporter, I would highly recommend getting on it. Um, you can search grants um, by mechanisms. You can look at all the K-23s that have been funded. You can look at um, K-23s that have been funded in eating disorders or that use a particular method that you're interested in using. Um, I would recommend looking up grants that have been funded in your series but in other fields, so to study other disorders. Um, I think because it's really helpful in kind of not getting you distracted by the idea and whether or not you agree with it or you think it's a worthwhile thing to investigate because we know so much about eating disorders. Um, and it gets you more focused on, okay, I don't really know much about what this other person's talking about maybe, but I, I do understand how their language flows and I like how they presented all of their ideas in an order that makes sense and sort of holds my hand and carries me along 
um, in just the 30 lines that they get for this abstract. So that's the piece that I think is helpful to pay attention to and helps inform your structure as you're forming this abstract. Um, it can also be helpful to try, if possible, um, to give little answers to all of the questions that are in the review criteria that grant reviewers have to use to review your grant um, and at least give nods to each of them in that paragraph if you can. It's a tall order, but it's really helpful if you can do it. Um, I won't spend time now going over specific examples from um, abstracts because you can look up so many of them online, um, but happy to take questions about them if you have them after. Um, the last specific section that I want to talk about in a little bit of detail is the research strategy in a training grant because it's really a unique beast in a training grant. Um, in almost every training grant, because of budget limitations and time limitations, you're not doing a five-year R01, you're maybe doing a, a one to three-year F grant or a four or five year K award, um, you're really framing a pilot study. Um, and it makes sense to use that terminology and acknowledging, hey, I recognize that this is a pilot study that's giving me pilot data for what my next step is. So I would say, don't try to hide things in your research strategy. Bring the reviewers along with you on the story, again, story-based, of what else it is that you considered as you were putting this grant and this idea together and why it is that you made the particular decisions that you did. So what does that look like? That looks like including a design considerations and section in your grant, as well as an alternative outcomes and future direction section. So I think maybe if you've seen other examples of um, R01 applications, you might be really familiar with sort of a pitfalls and alternatives section at the very end of the grant. I think most people include that. Not every grant that I've seen includes a design consideration section, and I think it's an incredibly helpful place to, again, capitalize on storytelling with reviewers to let them know, hey, I've, I've thought about all these other things that I could have done. Here's why I didn't do those things, and here's why I chose the thing that I chose. It's really helpful if you think um, also there's somebody on the study section who might be reviewing your grant who has a different way of thinking about something than the way that you're proposing to test it. And you can kind of give a nod to some of their research even and say like that you've recognized what their model says or what their measure does or whatever, but here's why you're using this other thing or you're following this other model or you're testing this other hypothesis. Um, so here's an example from um, my K award. This is a piece of my design consideration section. So here I um, have sort of enumerated in paragraph form, and you can see that there are five things that I enumerated. So I took up a lot of space talking about this, um, why I decided to do things the way that I did. So here I'm talking about why um, I chose the standardized meal that I chose for a fed state scan that I'm conducting, um, and sort of brought people along on the story of that I considered doing single item meals, look how many other studies did single item meals, and I also considered having people binge eat before I scanned them, but here are the reasons why scientifically I decided to do what I decided to do, and in a next step future study, I can test some of these other ideas um, using some of these other kinds of meals. Um, I also included here the sample size um, design consideration because I think it's probably one that everyone's F and K awards should include, um, which is an acknowledgement that your study is probably going to be underpowered, but another place to highlight why the research and the project is still going to be valuable anyway, even though it's probably just a pilot study. So I would recommend, again, not hiding these things, but being really explicit about your decision-making process. Um, the alternative outcomes and future direction, direction section is also another place to point out quite explicitly that your aims are independently valuable. Okay, so those are some specific tips for the meatiest um, sections of your grant. Now I wanna zoom out a little bit and talk about um, a strategy that I think is helpful to use throughout your grant. So across the research focus sections and the candidate um, and training sections of the grant which is to look at the review criteria that are gonna be used to evaluate your grant and try to use almost the exact same wording to make the reviewer's jobs easier. So I wanna show you some examples of that. So one review criteria for a K-23 is, are the candidates prior training and research experience appropriate for this award? So here's an example from my grant. Um, 
and I've highlighted in purple where I'm sort of addressing this question where I say these new designs, techniques, approaches, and conceptual knowledge build directly on my foundation of basic neuroimaging experience, right? So I'm linking my prior experience to what I'm proposing to learn how to do. This is one of many places where I made that link pretty clear. Um, I'll show you a figure that did that as well. Um, is there evidence of the candidate's commitment to meeting the program objectives to become an independent investigator in patient-oriented research? So the part that I honed in on there was commitment to becoming an independent investigator in patient-oriented research. So I put in a section that was called that. Um, this is in my candidate background section called commitment to a patient-oriented research career. So I'm literally using the exact same language from the review criteria here. This is that section I showed you before where I'm waving at the reviewers, introducing myself to them. Um, and then I'm closing this paragraph by saying my record of productivity funding and conference attendance demonstrates my full commitment to building a patient-oriented research career, right? So you can imagine that that might be an easy sentence for a reviewer to adapt for their critique of your grant in your pink sheets. So always keeping that in mind, how can I make the reviewer's job easier? Another example, what's the likelihood that the plan will contribute substantially to the scientific development of the candidate leading to scientific independence? So scientific independence is then something that you want to be um, really driving home throughout different sections of your grant. So here's a piece from my um, candidate training plan um, that's sort of wrapping a bunch of things up and talking about career development training. And I use this place as an opportunity to say that this K and the focus of the product project um, would ensure my independence with a program that's complementary to but distinct from my mentors. So really driving home how it would help me establish scientific independence. Um, and again, here's that same section I showed you before that um, before I was emphasizing how it, it showed that my proposed training was gonna build on my foundation of prior training. Here in the same sentence, I'm talking about how the things that I'm proposing to learn how to do in the grant are essential to my successful transition to an independent investigator. And then all of the um, detailed training aims sort of drive that point home independently for each aim. I'll show you again a figure that does that as well. Um, are there adequate plans for evaluating the candidate's research and career development progress? Well, it's worth it to create a section of your training plan that specifically goes over what the plan is for evaluating the candidate's research and career development progress. So here I have a section of the um, candidate background and career development training plan that talks about how my mentors would coordinate their mentorship and evaluate me. And then a table that actually goes through what criteria I would be evaluated on and um, what the timeline and plan was uh, for gauging sort of what my success was at different points throughout the five-year award. What would be kind of the benchmark for success? What would be the goals that I would be trying to hit? Um, and how would that be evaluated and on what schedule with my mentors? So again, really laying out specifically for the reviewers, look, I've, I'm addressing each of these points that you're evaluating me on. Is the research plan appropriate to the candidate stage of research development and as a vehicle for developing the research skills described in the career development plan? Um, so here is that example that I said I would come back to before, which is in the specific aims, link your training goals to your research as much as possible in every section of the grant, whether it's the research strategy where you wanna be talking about your training or the training goals section where you wanna be talking about the research, you wanna be linking those two all the time across all sections of your grant. So in the specific aims, it can be really helpful visually to link what the research aim is to what the associated training is. Then it makes it really clear how that research aim just serves as a vehicle for the training that you wanna get. So here's where I have that written into my specific aims. Um, other sort of general tips and tricks across the grant, I would say, are that a table and a figure say a thousand words. So in an F31 and F32, you get one page to talk about all your training activities. For both of my Fs, um, almost the entire page was a table. So here's an example of one of those. It looks busy from far away, but I can't imagine how long this section would have been if I tried to write it out in paragraph form. It is busy, it includes a lot of information for sure, but it also is a really helpful, almost cheat sheet for a reviewer to come back and say, 
How is she planning to spread this out over all three years of the award? What kind of mix does she have going of workshops? And how is that balanced with individual mentorship and going to conferences? Does she have enough going on um, with didactic meetings and formal coursework? Um, and so all of that can be really helpfully summarized in a big table. And you'll notice too that at the bottom here, I have a section of the table for research. That's not required because this whole section is supposed to be about training activities. But again, because the goal is to always link the research and the training to each other across all sections of the grant, it can be helpful to sort of let people know that you're thinking about how the research is really serving as a vehicle for your training too. Um, Quickly, I just wanna show you some examples of figures. So here's um, an example of how I presented both a model that I was gonna be testing in my F32 and overlaid in blue font my study aims on the hypothesized model. So that can be a powerful way to sort of visually represent your ideas. Um, here was a way that I used a figure to just show what um, all the different pieces of an fMRI study visit would look like for participants. So again, the, the reviewer doesn't have to be thinking in their mind like, okay, a participant does this and then this, and then how long is that all gonna take? It's all just laid out in a figure. Um, and here's that figure from my K award that I've been referencing a couple times now um, that visually all in one place shows what are the things that I've accomplished so far? What do I know so far from my F31 and my F32? What am I proposing to do with my K23 and how does it build on what I've done um, with those other grants? And then um, quite literally uh, the direction that all of this is pointing in is me moving towards an independent investigator who's an expert in the things that I wanna be an expert in. So um, the idea with these figures is, um, if you look at these two pages, you can't read what the text is, but which of these two would you be more excited to read? Um, your answer is probably the one on the right because it's not a wall of text. Um, so thinking about incorporating figures as much as possible to simplify your story and break up the wall of text can be really helpful. Um, in the last few minutes that I have, I just wanna, um, Show, present you with uh, some books that I found really helpful in helping to hone my scientific writing style. Um, one is called Writing Science. The other is Essentials of Writing Biomedical Research Papers. Um, both of these were really helpful in um, helping me think about things that I hadn't thought about before when it came to writing both uh, papers and grants. I think it's something we don't get specific instruction in um, very often in our grad program, so it can be really helpful to actually kind of read a version of a textbook for it. Um, this is a note that one of my good friends has on her whiteboard in her office that reminds her of some of the key points um, from that blue book essentials of writing um, that she keeps in her office to always remember. Um, and before I close, I just want to remind everyone that um, failure is the norm, not the exception when it comes to writing grant applications. Um, really the name of the game is perseverance and remembering that if, first, if at first you're not successful, don't be discouraged. Um, you almost never will be successful the first time around. And so um, learning how to respond to critiques and put a grant back in is just as important as it is to learn how to write the first one. So um, with that, I will close and say thank you so much for letting me speak to you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, now we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. If people wanna type any questions they might have um, into that Q&A box below. I'll read them out loud for Laura. Um, and perhaps while we're waiting for people to generate their questions, I can start with one of my own. Sure. Um, so um, I think um, one place, uh, what I've heard from a lot of people is that a really common thing that sinks training grants is that they're too ambitious. Mm -hmm. Um, so you definitely want to sell the feasibility of your study, and yet um, I think, like you said, you want people to be excited about um, the study you're going to do and the pathway you're going to go down as uh, um, with your research. And I guess, um, do you have suggestions for how to balance um, in a training grant specifically um, having something be innovative and creative enough that people are going to get excited about it, but also it's feasible enough that people will believe you can do it in a training grant. 
Yeah, I, that's a really good question because you're right. I think it does come up a lot. Um, I think that in terms of the feasibility piece, some of the acknowledging that it's a pilot study and having that section where you're sort of acknowledging um, that this is a, a grant mechanism that has boundaries is really helpful. Um, so I think you can sort of lean on the novelty and unexpectedness and um, cool possibilities of your idea in like an innovation section in your research strategy, um, which I don't think is necessarily required for F awards, but I would include in there to highlight how it's a new idea. Um, but I think um, for training grants, you do have to be a little bit less novel than you might think about being for an R01, often because you're carving out something new that might be related to, but separate from what your mentor is doing. Um, so I think you, you wanna be explicit almost about highlighting that dialectic that you're bringing up, Annie, which is to say like, um, here are the ways that my grant is novel, but here are the ways that I've also ensured that it's feasible. And so the word feasible should come up in your grant a couple times um, throughout to highlight that you've thought about both of those things. And in your design consideration section, you can say, we consider doing X, Y, Z, but to balance um, you know, feasibility with novelty, we decided to go this route um, and really sort of lay out how it is that you're thinking about the balance of those two things. But yeah, I do think it's, um, uh, especially if you're doing something like neuroimaging research, reviewers can get skeptical about something being too ambitious. There's also sometimes the opposite risk where people review, um, in particular K awards get reviewed right after all the R01s have been discussed. And so there's like a carryover effect where reviewers sort of are using the same criteria to evaluate your grant as an R01, which is also not helpful. So um, again, being really explicit about how you've thought about the limitations of your grant mechanism, the limitations of how many years you have to have to do the project, but also wanting to be innovative. Um, can be really helpful. Thanks so much, Laura. And, and building off of what you just mentioned, I think you can explicitly say, um, I will do X in the R01 that will come directly out of the grant I'm going to do. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, what questions do others in the audience have? And if there's not any, I, I'm happy to um, throw out more of my own questions for Laura based on things I typically hear from uh, people writing training grants. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, raise another question. Um, I, I suspect most of the people on this um, webinar are in some form um, of the some part of the process of maybe starting to write um, uh, a training grant. Um, although there may be some people who are earlier, and I know I often get get questions about um, how to. So much is um, evaluated on you as the candidate. Um, and how to get yourself into the best possible place um, for writing um, a, a training grant, whether it be an F or a K, um, both in terms of like your research products, things like publications and maybe other small grants and things like that, um, and in terms of pilot data. Um, and so, you know, I assume your timeline for six months or three months is the sort of active writing timeline. Um, but do you have suggestions about when to start thinking about those things, what to be doing in that sort of pre putting pen to paper phase? Mm, that's a really good question. I think um, a lot of that is really depends on the individual. I think for me, for my F31, I probably started thinking about the grant and knew that I wanted to put it in like a year before the deadline um, and started like pulling up like what kinds of things do I even need to turn in for this because I had no idea what any of these grants were about. Um, so I left myself a good amount of time to just familiarize myself with what was even required, which I think was helpful and I don't know that a whole year is necessary, 
but it was helpful for me for all the reasons that you're saying um, to think about like what pilot data could I include? Um, I mean, certainly a training grant reviewer shouldn't be expecting to see pilot data, but it doesn't hurt. Um, again, for some of those carryover reasons that I mentioned. So if you can think about if there's um, even just a hint of data that you can show that either support the model that you're testing um, that are coming out of your lab or show that you independently are able to collect the kind of data that you're proposing to collect, that can be really helpful. Um, so if in your grant you're wanting to use a new, um, a new method, let's say, so for my F31 I was using um, FNIR, it was helpful in my resubmission to have time to be able to collect some pilot data using FNIR because the reviewers were kind of skeptical of the newer methodology and one that they weren't as familiar with um, to show, look, we can get people with bulimia to, to complete this task that's new and to use FNIR, which is new. Um, and so it took some of the concerns away about using that method. So it was helpful to have time to do that. So I think it depends on how new your idea is, how different it is from what um, your mentor is already doing and what's going on in your lab and is already sort of a well-established pipeline in your lab. And if it's pretty close to what's already going on, I think um, you might only need a couple months before you're starting to write um, to really get things together. Thank you. We've got time for one more question from the audience. If people um, want to submit any questions they might have, I'll give you a second to write if you are interested in asking anything. Um, okay, um, so one last question then that I have is, um, Laura, you did such a good job going through all the um, all these kind of concrete ways to craft your language um, in grant applications. And like you said, most people are probably going to have to resubmit. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any um, suggestions on um, how to craft the response to reviewers section and um, and how to make sure that you're being uh, responsive? Yes, that's such a good question. I feel like we could do a whole separate webinar on that. Um, I would say, so there's, when you put in a resubmission, you get one page um, to summarize all of your responses and all the things that you changed, um, which can be really challenging if you had a lot of comments that you're trying to address. Um, so I would say get as many examples as you can, again, preferably from a field that is not your own, of what those introduction pages look like um, to see what strategies other people have used to cram all that information in. Um, the most helpful thing that I have done in putting in resubmissions has been to, to take the reviewer comments from the summary statement. Um, and put them in a table. So for those who aren't familiar, when you, when you get a summary statement back, there are three grant reviewers who review your grant. The first two write really detailed reviews and the third reviewer just writes like one paragraph and then gives you numeric scores. Um, and often then they'll, they'll have sort of similar things that they're commenting on. Sometimes they'll have different things that they're comment, commenting on. And then there's a big sort of summary at the beginning of your summary statement that kind of um, is an abstract of what happened in the room. Um, so after you've gotten that summary statement and after you've gotten on the phone with your program officer to talk about like if they were in the room, what happened? What was the vibe in the room like? Were people just like not emotionally excited about your grant? Um, or did people, did one person have really a bone to pick with one piece of your grant and it tanked the whole thing? Getting that kind of intel is really helpful before you start crafting your revision. Um, so after doing that, I would go through your um, summary statement and create a table that's kind of laying out what's the sort of overall theme of um, the different critiques and seeing if you can group them in, in mini themes. So was it that across the three reviewers, there were some concerns about how your subject population was going to be defined, for example, and one reviewer had problems with the BMI range and one reviewer had problems with the age range and um, whatever. Um, so then you can have one point in your introduction page that is sort of 
uh, talking to that thematic group that says like participant characteristics colon and then you just list very briefly what things you changed um, or didn't to address the concerns about participant characteristics. So I would say um, for me putting things in a chart or a table really helps me to visually organize my ideas about how I want to respond to something and the more you can present your reviewers with structure um, and pack a lot of information into an easy to understand single page format, the better success you'll probably have. Um, so getting lots of examples and, and making use of tables as you're crafting your response are probably my, my biggest pieces of advice for that. Great, thank you so much. Um, I see another question came in about if the reviewers are the same for Ks each time. They, I think they try to hold them consistent, but um, but the it's and you can see you you can see the people on the review panel um but you don't know exactly who's reviewing their case and sometimes it's different so um but i think they try not to that's a quick answer to that question so because we have to go ahead and wrap up um so uh thank you again to dr laura burner for a really fantastic presentation that I know gives us all a lot of ammunition for going out and getting uh, eating disorder related grants, um, which is so needed. Sure. And thank you for having me. Oh yeah, thank you so much. And um, just as a reminder, you can find out more about this and other upcoming webinars by visiting adweb.org and clicking on the events tab. And again, this will be um, stored uh, in the AED library for anybody who wants to go back for a rewatch. Um, so thank you again and um, Everybody enjoy your day.